And hello, everyone, and welcome to Open, the one only show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world right to you. I'm your host, Darren Hyman. Today, we'll update you what's happening in and around our borough, as well as across New York City. Coming up on today's show, we go front and center, providing you with information about monkeypox. What you need to know, the symptoms, the transmission, and how you can become better informed. Then, we'll talk about how new settlement is impacting the life of one individual, We'll tell you more details about that a little later on in the show. And then later, we'll learn about a woman-led worker-owned cooperative business that's engaging the community to focus on waste equity. And then finally, we'll discuss how one project is using artwork to beautify as well as bring awareness to the environment. So we encourage you to stay tuned because all this and much more is heading your way. Right now, we're officially open. You are watching Open. I'm Darren Hyme. We want to thank you for joining us. And uh, it's a show that brings the Bronx to New York City straight to you. We also want to welcome our viewers who are watching live on MNN as Open is being broadcast live on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network channel. We also want to invite you to stay connected to us on all of our social media platforms at BronxNet TV and, of course, our website at BronxNet.org. Well, some things have been going on through the past week. We'll take you through some of them with our Bronx updates. We start off with financial news. The Bronx People's Federal Credit Union has officially launched to address financial access challenges heightened by recent bank branch closures in Bronx neighborhoods. Our Bronx State reporter, Nora Osborne, brings us the story right now. Like the wheels on a van, money makes the world go round as the Bronx People's Federal Credit Union has geared up to launch a mobile branch in response to the financial access challenges exacerbated by recent bank closures. The green van that is soon to be making rounds all across the Bronx is a product of the Bronx Financial Access Coalition, which consists of numerous sponsors all aiding in the fight to bring financial accessibility and awareness to the Bronx. It's like a physical branch, but mobile, right? Like anything, when you go to any of our branches, anything you can do into that branch, you can do it here. You can open an account, you can apply for loan, you can apply for ITIN, which is a individual identification tax ID number. You can do everything really. We help you like with financial counseling if needed, but basic financial counseling, of course. And anything really, you can get, you know in a physical branch, you can do it here. All of those types of services come highly requested and needed in the Bronx, an area often described as a financial desert due to the systemic issue of redlining, which leaves its working class black and brown people feeling underserved financially as a result of the area being underbanked. Joining the Bronx Financial Access Coalition is Webster Bank, who serves as a sponsor for the mobile banking service. So it's a great opportunity to give back to the community. This is an area of um, our, our geography that has not a lot of banking services and so we're able to be the premier sponsor to help make this happen but more importantly it's how we come together with the community organizations hear what the needs are of the community and then put our dollars into action to give the community what it needs not what we think it needs it's a it's a demonstration of listening to the needs of the community the Bronx People's Federal Credit Union will be opening a permanent space in 2023 keeping Bronx residents on the money reporting from Boricua College I'm Noah Osborne well, in other news, we talk wellness. Jacoby North Central Bronx Hospital recently held a Girls Health and Wellness Resource Fair. Our Bronx Net reporter, Brittany Schuyler Aubain, was out on the field. It's time to get your glamour on as the Ambulatory Care Services and Public Affairs and Community Relations Departments at North Central Bronx Hospital held a Girls Health and Wellness Resource Fair. It's an opportunity to kind of infuse North Central Bronx with some new um, energy from our young women here in Bronx. 
Uh, so we're working with a program known as GLAM, and it's all about leadership, advocacy, and mentorship, and watching our young ladies grow. The event included a whirlwind of arts, meditation, and manicures, all in the name of self-care. As young girls and women face emotional, physical, and spiritual hardships, it was important that vendors showcased safe self-care practices. Anything that we can do to support and empower ourselves, just to be stronger, healthier, um, just to be able to handle what life throws at us, it's so important and it serves us throughout our entire lives. Specifically, for organizations like Not On My Watch, which helped young girls in the foster care system, shelter system, and group homes, it was crucial to take their girls on an outing to get their minds off the daily issues they face. We thought this day would be a benefit is to take them away from real life, to give them an opportunity to really enjoy the outdoors and the activities and let the community feed on, to feed them, encourage them, breathe over them. Jones told us that the Bronx tends to lead in in a number of chronic health issues, which is why North Central Bronx has made it its mission to combine preventative care with modern medicine. We really anchor on trying to be a primary care community hospital. And our organization provides preventative medicine, can provide higher level of care, um, but we want to get out in front. North Central Bronx hopes to continue empowering young women through a number of events and practices. Reporting for BronxNet, Brittany Schuyler Albain. And thank you, Brittany. And that is all the time we have for our Bronx updates. We encourage you to stay with us. Open continues right after this. Recent news, New York City Mayor Eric Adams issued an executive order declaring a local state of emergency in response to the monkeypox outbreak. Now, uh, the center of the five boroughs has become yet an epicenter for another health crisis. With cases in New York City rapidly increasing, many people are not properly informed of the virus. And joining us now to give us more details and bring us more light on this situation, we're pleased to have the president and chief medical officer at Advantage Care Physicians, Dr. Navarra Rodriguez. And uh, Dr. Rodriguez, thank you for joining us here. Thank you for having me. Well, as I said in the intro, a lot of people are still in the dark when it comes to monkeypox, and we're hearing more and more about outbreaks. But uh, first and foremost, let's get our viewers acquainted with what exactly is monkeypox? Absolutely. Monkeypox is a virus that is often transmitted through close, cl uh, close physical contact, and it can cause rashes, blistering type lesions. Um, often on the hands, the face, the genital regions, and it can be quite painful. It's not a fatal disease, thankfully, but it is one that's quite uncomfortable. And we've seen rising cases here in the New York metro area over the past several weeks. So when we look at this, how does one go about contracting monkeypox? Is it something that, uh, is there any uh, particular method or way that this is being contracted now? 
Yeah, so, you know, we are seeing that monkeypox is being transmitted through very close uh, physical contact, skin to skin contact predominantly, as well as large respiratory droplet transmission. And so we do want to really caution individuals to be aware of close physical contact with individuals who have monkeypox type lesions, rashes, blistering rashes, especially in the genitals, uh, the hands, the feet, the face, et cetera. But monkeypox can also be transmitted through uh, fabric content. So use bedding or towels. So we want people to be aware to minimize their risk of transmission for monkeypox is to avoid close skin to skin contact, uh, bodily fluid contact and fabric content with those who might be infected. And so when somebody looks around and says, uh, I don't know the signs or the symptoms, what can one look at to determine uh, this could potentially be monkeypox? Well, you know, I always encourage people to have a uh, uh, who have questions or concerns about exposure to monkeypox or other viruses to connect with their primary care physicians. Um, at Advantage Care Physicians, and as we think about our family companies of Emblem Health, we want people to be educated and to look for resources of information. Our websites at Advantage Care Physicians and Emblem Health have updates around signs and symptoms of monkeypox, um, what to look for, but also the New York State and New York City Departments of Health provide that information as well. I always encourage people to be on the lookout for anyone close contacts who may have rashes, again, blistering rashes, because those can also be indications of monkeypox virus and infection. And for one who may contract it, I guess the question is, where do I go from here in terms of treatment? And uh, how long will one have to really deal with this monkey? If they, if they can track monkeypox, how long are they dealing with the virus? Well, you know, with anyone who has any kind of physical symptoms, either rashes that they are concerned may be monkeypox or flu-like symptoms that can also be symptoms of monkeypox or other illnesses, they should connect with their primary care providers or healthcare providers to ensure they get adequate testing and it can have the management of the virus moving forward. We see that the virus usually presents symptoms within uh, three to uh, six days of exposure and can last up to a few weeks as well post that exposure. So being connected with a primary care physician is essential when anyone is concerned about their health. And I know treatment is done with uh, yet another vaccine. And I know uh, New Yorkers and people across uh, the United States are saying yet another vaccine. Uh, but give us uh, some insight into the vaccine and who should be vaccinated. Well, you know, anyone who has been exposed to monkeypox or fears that they've been exposed to monkeypox should be vaccinated. We've seen initially that the initial cases here in New York and in the US have been predominantly amongst men who have sex with men, but monkeypox is not limited to that community alone. And so I do want to encourage anyone uh, adult or child who may have been exposed to monkeypox to seek care with their healthcare provider and to seek the vaccination to help minimize the effects of the virus and minimize uh, any pain or discomfort that is associated with the virus. We do and have for your seen, uh, uh -huh, good and good. I, we have seen over the past few days expansion of the supply of monkeypox virus that's available in New York City and different administration of monkeypox virus to ensure that there's a broader supply to anyone who's been exposed and at risk. Yeah, and as a practitioner, I wanna ask the question for yourself, are you finding more and more people are asking questions or seeking information? Because there are a lot of people, as I said in the beginning, who are still out in the dark. Yeah, we, we are seeing a lot more questions. At Advantage Care Physicians, our website gets updated with information as we hear about it and see it so that our, our patient base can be educated and have a source of, of knowledge with emerging risks from different viruses like monkeypox. And so we are seeing a lot of questions and I do commend the team here for bringing more information to the public around this greater, greater risk. Yeah. So we talked about those who can get the vaccine. Are there others who may not be able to receive the vaccine uh, due to health issues? 
So we are not limiting who can't get the vaccine. We do want to make sure we're prioritizing individuals who are at risk of exposure or have had exposure, who may be immunocompromised and have weakened immune systems and more at risk for contracting the virus to prioritize those individuals to get the vaccine. As the supplies expand, we expect more and more people to get the vaccine across New York City. Is there any common stereotypes that we're hearing about this that we might need to debunk right off the right, right off the uh, right off the bat? Absolutely. You know, because the initial cases were seen in men who had sex with men predominantly, there were the stereotypes that this is purely a sexually transmitted disease and only limited to to those individuals. Viruses can change and morph and are not limited to one community versus the other. And so everyone should take precautions with regards to monkeypox and pay attention. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there months that are peak for this in terms of like the summer being a, a time that we have to really pay very close attention as opposed to the winter? Or, uh, or is it seasonal? I guess the question I'm asking. I would not say it's seasonal. And as we've learned through the pandemic, things can change on a dime and viruses emerge and change as well. So we want to highlight, we are seeing rising cases in New York City and New York State at this point in time, everyone should be aware and on high alert and work towards minimizing transmission, protecting themselves and ensuring that if they have concerns, they're connecting with their, their primary care providers. For those who have been affected, I know there's a concern about the reinfection rate. What is the possibility of being reinfected once a person contracts monkeypox? You know, I wish I could give you straight answers uh, around that, Darren. I, I think as we see how we manage through the vaccination effort to minimize reinfection and minimize exposure and risk, we will see emerging trends and, and be able to manage this virus more effectively. Yeah. Were you surprised when you heard the uh, fact that New York City is now becoming the uh, epicenter? I am not surprised. New York City is a hub for a lot of great activities. It <laughs> is a, an international city. We are at high risk for a lot of things. But the great thing about New York City residents, especially as we've emerged from the pandemic and as we work with state and city officials, departments of health and community organizations, is that we're a city that can take action quickly if we pay attention and understand that we have personal responsibility. Yeah, a lot of people are wondering, is there a possibility that there could be a risk of a larger outbreak given the fact of what we're seeing right now? There is always a risk of a, a larger outbreak, but this is why education is so important. For us to do the things that we've learned to keep our community safe, washing our hands, limiting areas where we may be exposed to dangerous viruses, taking care of our health, connecting with healthcare providers, and really managing chronic conditions and other health issues that may put us at risk for infections or other exposures. We can combat monkeypox just like we're combating COVID and making sure we're minimizing exposure during the seasons with flu and other viruses. We just need to, to pay attention protect ourselves, stay educated, and take action. What's it been like for you? I mean, obviously dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, we're still not out of it yet. We still got, uh, you know, new things to really worry about and be concerned about. Then you couple that with uh, monkeypox as a healthcare provider yourself. Uh, what's it been like for you over the past few months? You know, I, I can't uh, say that it has been easy for healthcare providers, but Viruses emerge all of the time, and as healthcare providers and as a community, we're constantly facing a variety of challenges. We just need to stay abreast of them, keep up with the science, and be engaged with our Department of Health officials and other organizations to ensure communities that need support and access to healthcare get them. That's the focus for us at Advantage Care Physicians and at Emblem Health. We want to make sure communities that may be at risk for different viruses or have different concerns about their health have a place to go to seek care 
to get education and be supported to get through these pandemics and viral exposures and any other challenges in our healthcare system that we will face going forward. We covered a lot of things, but before we go, one uh, issue that I did not talk about was that of those who are pregnant uh, and pregnant and you have monkeypox. Uh, what are the complications? Are there any potential complications for uh, a person that may be pregnant? You know, there is risk because the monkeypox can be uh, uh, transmitted through uh, bodily fluids and direct skin contact. So there's some risk of exposure to an infant during birth from an infected mother. For everyone, if they're pregnant, not pregnant, if they have symptoms of monkeypox, they should be working with their healthcare provider to ensure they're minimizing transmission to their family, their loved ones, their community, and making sure they stay safe and can get through this with the support of others. Uh, Dr. Navarro Rodriguez, thank you so much for being with us. Great information that you shared with us with regards to monkeypox. Of course, uh, we wanna make sure that people see their healthcare provider if they have any symptoms and take advantage of the resources. And I know that you've got some great resources uh, in your network right there. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Alrighty. Well, we want our viewers to know now, if you want more information, please don't hesitate. Visit the website at emblemhealth.com and then also the website, acpny.com. We don't want you to go anywhere. We are continuing, open continues right after this. Next guest is a young Bronx immigrant who's attending his top choice college come this fall, thanks to support received from a Bronx-based not-for-profit organization. He received help from New Settlement and the organization's enriching programs like the College Access Center and Young Adult Opportunity Initiative. And he's here now to share a little bit about his journey, a student at the University of Buffalo. Uh, we've got Frank Portes, and uh, thank you so much for being with us. Frank, you there? So much, guys, for having me. Hey, thank you and congratulations. Yeah, hey, I'm the here, I'm here. Okay, good. An opportunity for you now to, uh, as you're preparing yourself, as I said, to get ready this fall for uh, attending the University of Buffalo. First of all, uh, what's it like for you to be able to have all these college choices, but then now to have your top choice and you to be able to go there? Uh, honestly, I'm I'm just very excited. Uh, being honest with you I didn't know I was gonna make it this far but with the proper guidance and the proper help I was able to so now it was just very gratifying knowing how far I made it yeah so you were a part of the new settlement program and uh, they definitely helped you to get there uh, talk to us a little bit about the program and uh, your participation in it um, honestly it was very it, it was very helpful too. Um, when I told them my goals, my position, they, hey, they understood that's the first part and they were very patient and they knew exactly what to do with me. They guided me through the right programs, the right activities, the right things I had to do. And at the end, it all paid out. So yeah, I'm, I'm very glad I was part of the settlement and all the programs they could offer. I know uh, you have the College Access Center, and I want to talk about your journey because uh, you came from the Dominican Republic. Uh, you thought about wanting to become a lawyer. I did. Uh, it's, 
and and uh, and now here you are on the way to going and doing that. What was it like uh, in the program helping you to navigate some of the things to really get you to a place where you can be ready for college? Well, born as a U.S. citizen, I always knew the right time was going to come for me to go to that country and, you know, do something better for myself. But when I got there, I knew what my goal was, but I didn't know exactly how to achieve it. And right there was the settlement. Uh, it was like a punch right in the face, and they exactly knew what to do. Um, all the processes, some of them were very, um, for, were, they were a little stressful. Like, for example, completing all the forms, the financial aid forms, the essay, oh my God, the essay. But at the end, it was it was very they made it a lot easier than it's supposed to be because it's a really long process but they are really good they're really really good for you uh being, being a part of these programs i want to talk more specifically about another program that you're very familiar with, uh the young adult opportunity initiative uh what did you do in that program so when i got to decide that i was going to school it was it was a decision that we made that it was better for me to take a gap year, you know, between high school and college. So we, I took a one year gap and a new, my advisor, Shuba, New Settlement, she said that she had a program also made by New Settlement, which um, it's for young adults who are trying to find their next step in their journey. And the Young Adult Opportunity Initiative was a great opportunity for me to, um, keep deciding and making my path clearer. We also took a lot of workshops, like leadership workshops, job workshops, um, interview preps, you know, for people who want to get jobs. And my favorite class was um, first aid and CPR class, which was completely free. And I actually got a first aid certification because of it, which is very cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. And uh, you learned a lot. Uh, what would you say to other people who would think about attending a program such as this? Um, what were the benefits that you want to pass on that maybe another student can look at and say, hey, I want to be a part of this? First of all, I mean, it's not the first thing I want to highlight, but it's completely free of charge. It is 100% free of charge. Like, if you're thinking about giving it a try, you should, because the only thing you're really, you know, spending is like, what, two or three hours of your time every time you got to go to class, which isn't that bad. And it's only a 12 week program. Um, you also made a lot of friends. I made a lot of friends there and everybody on the staff is um, great, very supportive, very patient. Uh, they also support with Metro cards. If you are on the city and you need help, you know, getting back home or going back to the program, they also support with Metro cards and they also give you stipends every two weeks. But besides of that, the main thing I want to highlight is what you learn from it and what they prepare you for. And tell me about a little of the annual college day decision day event and uh, how'd that go for you? Oh, uh, that was a uh, event. Uh, my advisor Shuba told me like two weeks before the event. She said it's gonna be a program with a lot of um, high school seniors who already decided on college. There are going to be a lot of different programs and different um, companies there who will, you know, it's it's like a right moment to celebrate us, you know, students from different backgrounds. So at the end, we're on to all the same goal, which is going to school. And it was a very fun event. I also made a lot of friends there. We met um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. He gave a really good speech. And I think I actually took a couple of pictures of him. He's a very cool dude, too. <laughs> did you learn it? Where did, you, where did you learn from him? Well, one really, a part that is really, like, stuck with me from the speech was, uh, he said it's very contradictory in that setting, but he says it doesn't really matter what school you go to. Like, you just have to make it the best for, like, your your, you know, your career. Like, it doesn't really matter if you went to Harvard or to, like, Bronx Community College, at the end, it doesn't really tell how smart of a person or how better of a person you are. And he just said, any school that you go to, just make it the best for you. But don't go to a school because it's very prestigious. And 
yeah, that also sticks with me because I'm going to the University at Buffalo, uh, which is like, you know, it's a very good school in the New York State um, Department, but probably in the future, I'm going to meet people who are going to be like from other more prestigious schools and they're going to believe that because of that, their, you know, their degree is better than mine, which is probably not true. So yeah, that's, that's, I think, what I learned from him. Yeah. That's that's the truth there. Well, one, thank you so much for being with us. I think it's been a wonderful opportunity for us to hear a little bit about your story. And uh, Frank, best wishes to you as you attend the University of Buffalo, your top choice coming up this fall. Thanks for being with us. All righty. And we so want much. you to know that thank if you so want for more. Me, thank you for the wishes. Oh, I, thank you. I know we have a little time delay, uh, audio delay there, but uh, we got we got you in there. Uh, I want to tell you again, if you want more information, please join uh, and find out at the website, newsettlement.org. There you can find out about the college programs and the program that Frank was a part of and got him right there to the University of Buffalo. Also, you can follow them on social media at New Settlement and Why. We encourage you don't go anywhere. Open continues right after yep. this. Yep. to the show green fiend organics is a woman-led worker-owned cooperative business that's focusing on environmental justice and waste equity right in the south bronx now their main purpose is to engage the community through public education as well as outreach and partnerships with local farms and urban gardens we're pleased to have joining with us the founder and director of operations at green fiend organics dior saint hilaire and uh, good to have you hello hello thanks for having me you are out there in the field doing the work. So I, uh, I am I, out here in the field doing the work. <laughs> well, listen, we, we, we want to make sure our guests know that, you know, you're not just behind some guests. You're out here doing, you're out here doing the work. But uh, for somebody who doesn't know about Green Fiend Organics, give us a little bit more. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, Green Fiend Organics, as you already uh, mentioned, is a, a local worker owned cooperative. For us, our focus is really on hyper local processing so that we can limit the amount of waste that needs to be exported out of the city, but also being able to provide um, a green job training program for young people to be able to reconnect them back to um, the, the environment where normally they, they may not necessarily do that. So our work is uh, really, really um, around making sure folks kind of bring this connection of closed loop systems. And so, you know, a lot of times we talk about farm to table uh, and at Green Feed Organics we're here to prioritize table back to farm and do it in a way that empowers community um, to be able to be self-determined. So for somebody who doesn't know, I want to go over a couple of terms. Talk to us a little bit about the word compost. What does that mean? Absolutely. So, you know, I use hip hop. So people ask me what compost is. I tell them compost is black gold from deep in your soul, edible and too incredible for farmers to grow. And so essentially compost is natural organic fertilizer, right? Um, and what it is, is going to happen anyway. I say compost is human assisted decomposition because this will happen anyway. And so compost is what you use. You take your old food scraps, you mix them with some, some brown dry material. And over time with the right conditions, you get a hummus-like material that you can reapply back to soil in order to help enrich it and help the plants be stronger and healthier. So when we talk about this and how it translates, it translates into 
being something else. And so what happens from compost? Where does it go from there? Yeah, so basically we start with the food scraps, right? And so that's the important part. That's the part that we're like, we have um, a rally that happened last week. And so that's kind of what the push is, right? The push is to get more people in New York City comfortable with diverting their food scraps to actually say, you know what? I will not put this valuable resource in the trash. So I think that that's really the first step is to get folks to kind of um, separate their food scraps. But within the process, we have the food scraps, we mix it with the brown material, and it is through our process of turning, aerating, and all of that to sifting it. Once we sift the compost, we literally just put it on the soil. People go into the store and they buy synthetic fertilizer to put on uh, their soil to help their plants to grow. The miracle grows, you know, to help their plants to thrive. But we're creating that um, from material that that we're using right here in in our in our backyards in our city. So this has the opportunity also to be able to do something more, which is possibly land some green jobs. Give us the correlation between how compost really helps with green jobs. Absolutely. I would love to answer that for you. So obviously we have our young people that actually work out in the garden. They actually are hand turning, right? A lot of these compost piles, they're, they're dealing with the education, right? Within the community so that more folks can learn about it and know about it. Um, we're actually out on a site visit right now at Big Reuse out here in Queens with our young people showing them uh, a composting system on a larger scale. So these green jobs are jobs that are, are, are specifically um, meant and centered on stewarding the earth. Unfortunately, this has been looked at uh, traditionally as volunteer uh, sort of work and labor work um, that is, see, people are calling, yeah, I got to call them back um, about the composting work. Um, and so essentially, it's really important that we bring the, the importance of this being paid labor, that it's a sanitation type of labor, but it is a green job because it's about environmental stewardship um, and it deserves to be paid. Um, it is not something that uh, just needs to be volunteer labor, but that we need to value and actually ingest as a part of our, our sanitation system here in New York City. So when we look at what's going on around uh, New York, we hear a lot more about a push for a green economy. Uh, we hear a lot about climate change and really how we really need to be taking care of our community. When you look at what's happening right now, are you satisfied what you're seeing by way of awareness? Do enough people know? Absolutely not. And I think that that's one of the concerns that we have is that we would like to see a uh, sanitation in our city council actually put more money behind education and outreach because what we've seen is that just building the infrastructure without the actual um, knowledge um, or buy in from the people to participate, we've already seen the, the failure of, of some programs that have come before. So I think that what it's really going to, going to take um, are creative organizations um, like mine, right, like that are using hip hop in order to be able to promote this messaging and invite people in, uh, organizations like BK Rot, that's actually creating training programs for young people to, to attach to the, these kinds of um, experiences. So I do strongly believe that, no, I'm not quite satisfied. I don't think too many people are in it. I'm happy to see the direction that the city's going in. And I believe that we have people in city council that are here to fight for this um, and fight for the right thing, not only for the people and the health of the people, because this is a public health concern. Let me be clear. Um, if we think about the, the, the um, current sanitation practice that we do have. Um, and so just to see our city council members putting some energy behind that, I think is excellent. Um, but I think that we do need to put some more funding behind education and outreach in a very, very real way and let communities talk to each other um, so that we can kind of come into this behavioral shift that's, that's necessary for this to be a successful program. So when you have the community out there, obviously they're becoming more and more aware, but what can they do on from the beginning to get more involved to have a, a green hand in this? Yes. So I would say that um, one of the things that could happen is one, get out to your local food scrap drop off locations, right? That's the best way to start connecting um, with, with the built infrastructure. Go volunteer at a local community garden. You can come to us, right? We're at Synergy Urban Garden. We're right there uh, in Community Board 3, right there on 1211 Ho Avenue. And you can come and, and compost with us and see what's happening. We'll have a little, you know, a little freestyle. We might do a little, um, um, little boogie down basuda cipher you know we have a good time there um definitely get out to the com your local community gardens if you visit the green thumb website i'm actually representing them right now these are the people who um steward the park's lands uh, for community gardens go on their website you can find a local community garden closest to your neighborhood um go on dsny's website to figure out where the compost drop-off locations are volunteer with green Fiend organics if you want to know all things compost especially in the bronx we should definitely be your first stop so yeah those are some ways that you can start off there's also a 
master composter training course. Um, but I think that those are, that's for people who really want to nerd out about this stuff. But if you're just like trying to get your, get your feet wet, like, okay, you know, I just want to see what's going on. Come for a, a tour visit at Synergy Urban Garden and we can contour the site and the systems for you so that you can kind of get some hands-on experience. You know, you're very grounded and rooted in this. Talk to me about your inspiration. What was it really that sold you on, I really need, I really need to make my community better through this area of environmental justice? Oh man, Woo, where did it start? Okay, it started <laughs> with it started with Karen Washington when I, I first learned about bugs as the organization. And so I heavily got into urban agriculture and farming and I started doing apprenticeships um, on farms and you know, was just kind of growing my work um, and growing food. And I, I, I was bothered by the fact that we kept talking about uh, farm to table. And I was like, but nobody's gonna give it back. like. We're just gonna like be like, oh yeah, farm the table. I'm healthy. I'm eating green. I'm at the farmer's market and I'm gonna throw my scraps in the trash. I was like, the disconnect, the disconnect, the disconnect. What are we doing? So I think that that like heavily informed uh, that there was a need and I saw something that was missing, right? Um, and then you fast forward to the South Bronx being environmental justice community that handles over 30% of the city's waste because of the, the waste transfer stations that were cited, right? Um, in these poor communities intentionally, right? I also do work with the Bronx Swab um, and, 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 and all of that to say that for me, I said, wow, we don't have access to our waterfront because we're, we're handling trash. Wow, we're so devalued that people think that we're only good enough to handle garbage. Like, nah, we can make beauty out of is. And so I started putting my energy uh, into learning as much as I could about the structures that existed within the city um, and then really just immerse myself in, in everything really. Um, and then from there, that allowed, that kind of like took me to the master compost training course. And it, it has literally, my love for everything has just grown from there, the more that I learn. But I felt like the one of the reasons we're a worker owned cooperative um, is because again, self-determination is very important. Um, try, trying to make this system um, less centralized, decentralizing even the system of waste is something that I'm very, very passionate about. I believe that, that we are, are affected by the problems that we didn't create, but we most certainly have the solutions. And so that is what drives me is being able to bring um, young people into it so that they may learn power, but also to be able to bring my people back to the land because we have a traumatic relationship with it. And this is a way that we can reconnect back to it with joy. Um, so that's really what moves me and drives me um, to do this do, to, to, to do, um, do this work. <laughs> yeah. So for people who want to get connected, what do they do? How do they, how do they become a part? Yeah. Definitely follow us on social media. That's always the thing, follow, right? But really, if you want to get tapped in, you need to join our volunteer list um, because one of the things for us is like, we're very um, uh, connected. And so it's important that like, if you want to talk to us and see us, you got to come out, right? It's not just a, you want to experience us from the far. We're better in person. Like some people are like, don't text me, girl. I'm like 2% text. I'm like 20% on the phone, but baby, when you see me in person, it's a hundred percent. And that is very <laughs> true and reflective of Green Fiend. So come out, you know, with us, join the, the um, email list, the volunteer list and yeah, come, come join the family. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I think it's great that you are taking this initiative, leading this initiative, and hopefully uh, we'll get more people connected. Great having you with us. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much. All righty. Well, we want to let you know if you want more information, I'm going to give you the screen. I'm going to get to the screen right here and tell you how you get more information. What you do is you can visit the website, and the website is greenfeenorganics.com. Again, greenfeenorganics.com. want to take the time again to thank Dior for being with us, and uh, don't go anywhere because Oprah will continue right after yeah. this.
to the show, Trash Project is an interactive idea to promote urban beautification and environmental awareness by organizing an art practice around the common trash, uh, I should say the common task of trash disposal. Now the project is helping to reduce the community's consumption and lower their contribution to the trash problem. Joining us now, we're pleased to have the founder of the Trash Project, Adrian Con Kondratowicz. And uh, Adrian, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And so when we look at this here, um, you really found a unique way to really address an issue that a lot of New Yorkers are facing. And uh, talk to me about what got you involved with the Trash Project. So the concept started in um, 2008. Um, I was living in, in Harlem for a few years and I, I, I kept on being um, a little disgruntled and um, uh, disheartened by how some community members disposed of their trash on the street. Um, in addition to um, the uh, lack of services we had in that area at the time. Um, and things became apparent, you know, uh, quite fast that you had to do something, but uh, um, we didn't want to um, polarize the community by, um, by uh, creating a situation where we're just talking about the problem. And um, being a painter, I, I wanted to uh, distinguish uh, this, this idea by creating um, an interactive concept for people to engage in. Kind of like looking at a painting, but um, instead of just uh, visually uh, studying one, uh, th this is an opportunity for people to create their own with the trash bag. So once the trash bag fills up, it creates a sculpture. And so environmental justice is the key here, right? How do we get people to become more environmentally conscious, more environmentally friendly. Uh, as you began sharing in neighborhoods, what was the response like when you started talking to people about this whole issue of trash and environmental justice? Well, you know, um, a lot of things um, deal with this issue, regardless of um, how we uh, position it or how different communities read that problem. Um, but at the same time, um, it's something that can bring a lot of people together where we can create a solution collectively by um, volunteering, because this is the, uh, the, the way the project functions for the most part uh, and, and coming together and, and, and give, giving back to our communities um, in ways where we are um, uh, participating in civic engagement and the democratic process. Um, simply by uh, spending some time on our street. We don't have to go far um, to make a difference. So part of that civic engagement is really organizing community cleanups, getting buy-in from the community to be able to do that. Uh, so give us a little bit about the community cleanup, how it's actually gone and, um, and who are you reaching out to? Right, so when we started out in Harlem, it was more in terms of the awareness that we were trying to build up around these issues and give people an opportunity and an access point um, for this type of programming. And ours is a great mediator um, and provides an amazing invitation for, for people that might look at trash cleanup in a, in a way that um, uh, reminds them of something negative. So hence the color of the bags and, 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 and the polka dot pattern. But um, you know, we've, we've done cleanups and projects in seven different countries and it became apparent to me that it's really um, a question of looking at how we contribute to the problem and how we can uh, uh, and add to the solution. You know, as, as, as Americans, we produce uh, uh, five, uh, 30% of the world's trash with 5% of our population. That, that's about um, uh, 1,700 uh, pounds of trash a year per resident uh, in the US. And in Europe, that's about 1,100 uh, pounds in comparison. Um, the trash that makes it into our ocean, um, you know, it. Originate eighty percent of that originates on land, and we forget sometimes we are an island. Um, when things blow off or get out of our way, that usually makes it into our waterways, and then that's how 
we contribute to the problem. But at the end of the day, there are two main problems or issues that um, kind of exasperate and, 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 and passively contribute to this without us even knowing. And it's our consumption, it's our overconsumption here. You know, and it's, you know, still practices like uh, removing um, plastic film and packaging from, from your trash and just focusing on, this, on, the, on the food scraps and the actual stuff that has to go to the landfill or, or be burned. Um, it makes a big difference. And you'll see the, 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 how much packaging and, and, and synthetic materials add to, this, to add to this mix, you know, and it's everything from how we package our food, you know, water, thing, things like that. But, you know, um, it's, it's nice to go around and, and do these big projects, but, you know, the, 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 the action has to start at home. It's in our communities. And if um, we um, have time to do other things, I'm sure we can find time to do, to do um, a little give back, um, whether it's a little gardening, you know, in the tree pits. Um, there's, there's so many great groups in Harlem and um, in the Bronx um, that um, give back already. And uh, what we like to do with, um, with the project is highlight their work when they use the bags they um, uh, make themselves more visible. And that's, that's a big, you know, that's a big effort and it's a big plus for the city and, and any community that has a group like that. Um, it just shows that the, the, that the, the, um, uh, the desire to help is there, you know, it's just creating programming around it. And that's where the, the trash project comes in and helps people organize or is a model for how to organize so um, the, uh, the last cleanup that we had in Harlem came about the same way. The young, young uh, woman, Imani Cruz, she got in touch because she saw the work that we were doing at St. Nicholas Park. We have a uh, year long um, engagement at St. Nicholas Park that started in 2015. And um, I coached her through the process of starting her own cleanup, getting the tools, um, just uh, giving her the tools of the trade in a way. Um, and she was a quick study. She turned everything around super fast. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully she'll continue her efforts and, and go forward. Um, she's uh, our third group that we've been able to coach this year, along with uh, um, we run Uptown, which is a Walk in the Heights group, um, and the, uh, uh, the Humane Collective, which is a Bronx initiative. Right. I want to go back for a minute to talk about sculpture because you use sculpture as a way of really drawing people in, creating awareness for people to really think about trash and trash disposal. Um, so again, talk to me about how you call, come about creating this sculpture and your hopes in it. Well, you know, the, this is a practice that everyone kind of does regardless. You know, it's just the the idea behind um, highlighting this everyday mundane thing um, uh, came out of um, a long heritage of ready-mades going back to Duchamp um, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the philosophy about art in the 60s and the 70s, how things were a little bit more participatory, participatory and engaging and could be used as a tool to um, usher in a new consciousness and a, and a creative thought that uh, was more focused on problem solving. Um, so um, all the ideas kind of synergized together in this in this project. So once you fill up the bag, uh, it takes form, and and the color highlights that form, and the pattern draws you in. So um, initially, um, uh, the the first form or iteration of the project was called the maximalism where we engaged businesses and residents um, in um, uh, participating in the project. And uh, uh, we provide them with bags and they would use them and then their, their street or their block, the next three blocks would be turned into a giant art installation. And then we would comm commemorate each, um, each event with a, um, plastic uh, painting um, to just kind of tie it all back together and, and give people an idea of 
what they're actually engaging in. So for people who want to get connected, what do they do in terms of supporting the work that you got going on? Obviously, you're trying to uh, engage the community a little bit more. How can they play a part? Well, we have a couple of different initiatives. Um, you know, uh, the simple way is to just come to one of our events and, and participate. Um, if people have ideas on starting their own, please get in touch and we would help uh, facilitate any sort of um, um, help that we can. Um, uh, we also have a couple of initiatives uh, that help fund what we do. We usually uh, make do with art sales and, and grants, but um, we are interested in creating um, a permanent solution that empowers the community, but also uh, takes the resources that are already there and kind of transforms them um, in a way that uh, provides services for everybody, regardless if you're a bid or if you're not a bid. Um, and it's called the trash fund. Um, and that's something we're developing and seeding. Um, and then uh, I guess the most straightforward, uh, the other most straightforward way is to buy an artwork from the project. We have prints and then we have these beautiful uh, 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 plastic paintings and collage pieces um, from, from uh, uh, different collections um, that the money from the artwork goes back to the project and we're able to do more work. Well, Adrian, I want to thank you so much for being with us and uh, certainly continue the great work of beautifying our community. This is environmental justice in a good way. And I uh, thank you for the work that you do. You know, the one thing I would like to say in closing, you know, all of this kind of adds up um, in how this affects our health because um, at the end of the day, um, these are chemicals that we're uh, you know, kind of uh, redistributing into the environment and they're starting to interfere with the natural processes and systems, you know, from water, from earth, from the soil quality. Um, and now, you know, the, there's an issue of microplastic. There's a, um, for people who are interested, um, uh, Dr. Shauna Swan, um, she is an um, uh, environmental and reproductive health uh, epidemiologist, and she has uh, conducted a study on um, uh, the reproductive health of males and how plastics, microplastics affect um, people, especially females, while they're pregnant and how these disturbances, these hormonal disturbances can be passed on to the fetus and to the newborn um, and how it also affects uh, the, the reproductive um, um, health of, of, of males in general. So these are issues that we need to pay attention to, how we package our food, what we drink out of, and how we take care of our communities, because it's, it's, um, it's something that we can't reverse once it's done. You know, this is, we're, get, we're getting a little too, too close to the threshold. Yeah, we're going to pay real close attention. And, uh, Adrian, thank you for bringing this to us. And uh, again, thank you for being with us here on the show. Uh, thank you for having me, and I hope this was informative. Yes, Ad Adrian Con Chondratoids. Yes. I got it right. All right. Thank you much. All right. Well, thank, thank you. you. Now, listen, if you want more information, we want our viewers to know you can visit the website at trashproject.biz. Again, trashproject.biz. Well, we come to the end of our show today. We want to thank all of our guests for joining us and also you, the viewer, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Recablecast on Bronx Channel 67. If you have Verizon Files, that'd be channel 2133 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. If you want a brand new episode of Open, we encourage you to come back Friday morning. My girl, Rena Valentine, we're bringing the best of arts and entertainment right here on Open. I'm Darren Jaime saying thank you for watching. Until the next time we meet, stay safe. Most of all, let's keep this channel wide open.